There we go. Now we're live. Welcome, guys. Red morning. You know the deal. Oh, I was going to do it. One sec, Carl. One sec before you start. I. <laughs> Where's that stupid thing? Brand. <laughs> we'll consider that first part the hook before the introduction. How's it going, man? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That that wasn't gay as fuck as all, man. It's not gay at all. Whatever. It's coffee house stuff. Coffee's the theme because everybody's coffee with red something now. Dick yeah, riding off my shit. It, like the whole thing is like all the other morning shows are like coffee. We're like the drinkers. <laughs> That's like our shtick. Like all the other ones come here for coffee. We're like they come here and have a beer at nine o'clock in the morning. No no judgment here. Yeah, well, it's still a coffee, but I've Irish the shit out of it, so whatever. Actually, they got a horchata, mm. like Irish coffee now, which is pretty delicious. The Mexicans handled that one pretty well. A horchata what? Horchata, it's like Irish cream, but it's horchata. I have horchata, no idea you, what that is. Do you know what that is, is right? Or... Nope, no clue. Oh, it's like a Mexican drink made with rice and cinnamon. But it's it's kind of creamy in the same way that almond milk makes like a milk like substance. It's like one that you do with rice. It's really good. Okay, I had to almost puke enough. the first time I tried it. Look at this. Yeah, well, you have to keep in mind that when I when Ryan Irish is the fuck out of his coffee, he doesn't put like whipped cream and shit. It's just basically half whiskey. Yeah, just whiskey and a little bit of like cream <laughs> or the salted caramel. Anyways, uh, what were we just talking about beforehand? Because that's kind of why we went live right then, because we wanted to get in the middle of a thought. Yeah, because like my thinking was like you were mentioning it, like if you could get like 10 channels and make a grand off each, you're kind of set. And my thing was like, okay, if I could actually do that, I'd change my life trajectory and just do like 10 black maple channels <laughs> for a grand each and never have to deal with corporate again. Oh, dude, it'd be awesome. Liver literally live in the dream. But we're on. So I got four channels now. There's Twitch, there's YouTube, there's Patreon, and then there's Amazon, like for the book. So basically what you're saying is you're 4chan. <laughs> well, I haven't dropped many F-bombs. Anyways, rip in the chat, by the way, Leafy officially got banned. That's the other thing. So I don't know if you know who Leafy is. He was like a YouTuber. He's kind of known for bullying autistic kids. Um, he came back to YouTube briefly. Long story as to why he finally just got banned because he went after this guy H three H three and Pokimane, basically like a bunch of simp's for this e thought, got him nuked from orbit. Well, you know that goes to show you don't try to get between autists and their Twitch thought. It's just not a good <laughs> move, man. Yeah, but everybody does that. I mean, Stefan Molyneux, Roosh, like everybody's getting banned from everything. And sure, you can do the Patreon thing and sue, but. The big reason I'd rather have like 10 small channels as opposed to one big so I can get booted from any single platform or even a couple platforms and still not disappear off the face of the earth. Well, you that's know, just I think risk. it's just like if you look at like Roosh and Stefan and all of those dudes, it's mm -hmm. they were kind of asking for it. Not to victim blame here, but like, oh, they were. Weren't they kind of like poking the bear? Absolutely. With a huge ass fucking stick. In fact, I'm almost positive that that's part of the grift for like conservative Twitter or whatever you want to call them to be able to say, hey, the liberals banned me free speech, guys. Am I right? Buy my pamphlet 20 bucks. Like, I have no yeah, doubt that that's the case. Oh, I have no doubt for that either. It's just like if you look at them, like everyone has been kind of trying to push the oh, yeah, my message is so controversial that oh, my God, they banned me. It's like the Milo Lula strategy. Oh, yeah. Except for he used so much coke, he ran through that two million he had made really quickly. Now he's back to being broke. Um, Yeah, changing. So I guess what's the topic? The topic is us talking about what to do after you've stepped on your own dick. Instead of analyzing the footprint, how do you move ahead? We're trying to be actionable here. Well, it was kind of like both. Like, A, like, how do you set a course for yourself? And how do you get there without stepping on your own dick? And how do you know when you've stepped on your own dick and you need to course correct? Yeah. So my thoughts on it, I always lean on OODA loops, which observe, orient, decide, act. Vinkatesh Rao talked about it. It came from an Air Force general. How you like have air superiority, as long as you're able to cycle through that more often. And it kind of leads to self-awareness. So if you're aware of what you're doing and the consequences of the actions that you're doing, it makes it very easy to course correct. 
And then by focusing on the process, you don't get ego invested on any individual thing you're doing. So where you double down on, say, I don't know, calling Rolo a fraud. <laughs> well, for me, it's more like, I think the OODA loops is a good move, but mm -hmm. those kind of require a degree of honesty with yourself that a lot of people don't have. It's true. Because I, I pass mean, that. Well, everything requires that you're honest with yourself about where you're at. Like most of the guys who are doing like the, uh, uh, I think Rolo calls it blue pill game. Mm hmm. It's basically a version of game where they're like supplicating, they're being nice to her, they're just being themselves. And they can fail at that for like 10 years, but they get one girl and they're like, yeah, this validates the process because she understands me. She actually appreciates this shit. Oh, good point. Meanwhile, she was the BPD one who just wanted to mark. Yeah, and for me, that's more, the most important thing with being able to course correct is but actually being honest about where you're at. And I think that was the issue with, you know, certain con holders in Florida, for instance, is they were just not self-aware. Well, self-aware is the wrong word. They were just not capable of seeing uh, where they were at themselves and who actually brought the value. And that it's kind of like, have you, you watched Kitchen Nightmares, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole thing with him when he goes into one of those restaurants is that usually the owner is kind of either they're clueless which you, you can actually teach people not to be clueless or they're deluded and like the first 15 to 30 to 45 minutes of every fucking show is him like you're delusional you have no idea what you're going you're not seeing the reality <laughs> you're an effing most... donkey <laughs> and yeah you're what's what's the, the idiot sandwich thing yeah but that's kind of where when you need that wake-up call and very few people are comfortable giving someone that wake up call. Well, so there's costs involved with it. Like if dude, if you're with buddy and he's got a girl that he does not like, and you kind of speak up, there's a good chance you're going to lose the friend. Cause he's going to pick her over you and she's going to weaponize her love, his love for her against you as well. So, I mean, like I get it. You don't want to red pill your friends. You don't want to. Well, you know, give the, the people general rule is like people are always going to side with whoever is sucking their dick at the time. <laughs> And that's not necessarily like a physical dick either. That could be a metaphorical dick as well. Like whoever is basically catering to their ego mm -hmm. at the time they're going to side with. Yeah. But uh, I didn't really see the show though as being about like, how do you red pill your friends? How do you like do uh, like, how do you fix your friend if he's fucking up? I'm more about no, like, how do you, how do you know when you're fucking up? Well, I'm treating like you as the your friend. You are your best friend, essentially. You wipe your ass every day. Why wouldn't you be, right? So uh, I just think that the, like, the A to B is important. Just figuring out where you want to go, just so you have that as like a baseline. And then mm -hmm. you can always tell, is this helping me get closer to B? Or is this putting me further from B? Am I threading water? What's going on? Yeah. So the one thing I will argue, it's good to have a relationship about. Because a girl doesn't really care about your ego investment. She just kind of, she'll love to call your bluff. So it kind of keeps you on your toes. You have to kind of think like, obviously you don't sit there and like, gee, maybe you have a point. Maybe I am a dick and then stop doing whatever, but at least it'll give you some time to self-reflect afterwards. Does she have a point? Is she right? Am I just wasting my time being a professional Mega Man 2 player or what? Hypothetically, yeah, it's not actually come up. I'd Girls are, they're not like brutal, like you're full of shit, fuck you. They're more like subtle with it. Like she starts to act out. It's usually because you did some shit that sent her a signal. Like I have no fucking clue what I'm doing right now. And I'm fucking this up for us. Mm -hmm. Because girls are like, I think it's probably some evolutionary thing, but they're oddly like they notice immediately if something is going to affect their security or comfort. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's a nice thing. But at the same time, like every like you can't be cut and dry with this stuff. At the same time, that assumes you got a girl that's a keeper and not one that's just a ball buster for the sake of it or a bipolar chick who just wants to break men down. It's like everything always has to come with that self-awareness at the end or that contextual understanding of where that person's coming from. I think that's what happens when, uh, you know, the uh, gentleman we may have made some fun of last show has been doing pickup for 10 years and got an eight lace. And that's like an average of 0 0.8 lace per year. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about, man. No idea. 
And like not to specifically like make fun of people because I actually feel like that's that's the saddest fucking story ever. Mm-hmm. But at that point, like when you get to year two of practicing pickup and you've gotten 1.6 lays, which essentially adds up to like you've gotten one lay in a blowjob. At that point, you should probably start to kind of readjust where you're at. Yeah. Although here's my question. Is it? We're going to use him as an example here. I don't know. But um, is the lay count, is the notches, is that the metric he's using for success? Or is it the identity? Because I've noticed that. I think we talked about that last time on Rule Zero Two, where it was build yourself an identity and then do what that kind of person would do. And I think that's how you get in that spot. Like, I want to be a day gamer. What do day gamers do? They approach and they say all these fancy words. But they don't focus on the notch count because that's like an action, and not an identity. Kind of forming this as we talk here so it might not be the most clearly thought out plan <laughs> oh, I, hey. I kind of get what you're sorry I was kind of trying to be active with your fucking chat people too but uh, I think it, that's the identity thing is big like you know the guy who suddenly is like okay I'm going to be a trad now so he buys a couple of flannel shirts he starts going to Home Depot he buys himself a truck he starts fishing Yeah, he doesn't really enjoy it but it's more about the identity yeah, and you get I to think, fit in with a group. and But that's why also why you need those hard metrics. Because like if you've been fishing for five years and you've gotten 0.8 fish a year, <laughs> you, you should really try, you know, actually putting a fucking some bait on your fucking hook, man. And, I agree. At that point, it's just bad. And it's just, I think that's the, like the male perspective on things. Like you can do whatever you want. Like we're kind of non-judgy with our friends, you know, for, for the most part. Yeah. But at least, you know, know the success metrics with involved with that pursuit. So if you want to want to go hunting, fine by me. Just kind of figure out what the metrics are for hunting. If you want to go do pickup, figure out what the metrics are for pickup. Like, I did 50 first dates in six weeks. It was actually less. I couldn't believe you made that, by the way. I know you set yourself the goal. I was like, good luck to you, sir. <laughs> well, you burned out on that dude, didn't you? You basically oh yeah, I mean, burned out ball. hard. But <laughs> but the, that that's kind of my personality in general, man. It's just I um I just kind of tend to go ham on anything I want to do, mm-hmm. and I usually always burn out. It's just how my personality works. Like I, it doesn't matter what I'm interested in. Like I, I could be interested in like cooking was the same way. Like. I started on that and I took every single recipe in the Julia Child uh, book in like the first month. Mm-hmm. I was having dinner parties like twice a day about it. Yeah, but that's that's the beauty of it is, sorry, the girl was showing me, uh, she went to the farmer's market today and we've got like eight cases of like tomatoes and stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, but that burnout is good because then it kind of lets you, it calibrates you. You know what I mean? Like now, you know, if you want to do cooking, how much can you do before that's too much or, you know, playing wow, how much is too much for a burnout? And I don't think a lot of people know what their limits are unless they test them like that. Work, same thing. If you haven't had to have a drink just to go to bed after work because you can't stop thinking about the project, then you haven't been overworked. You just haven't. I agree with you. And I think that burnout is also like a useful thing because it lets you know that you've actually done the fucking work. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, again, I got to preface that. Like some people just like burning out for the sake of burning out, but they're just spinning their wheels too. But I'm cutting you off. Keep going. Yeah, but you can burn out by spinning your wheels. But I think that's why it's important to have objective metrics and things. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's why I set myself a metric when I was doing like the first date thing. I just set myself a metric. I'm doing this many. And I'm trying to have this lay ratio. Yeah. And then what I remember was arbitrary too, wasn't it? It wasn't like any scientific backing behind the numbers. No, I just did it for fun, man. Yeah. It was just like, for me, but the funny thing that I actually discovered from it, when like at the start, you're kind of going through all the game motions, but when you get to like first day 25 in like 12 days, you're like, you just cut all the bullshit out. And your whole thing, you just go in there and you go like mode one on steroids <laughs> because you're just like, okay, I can't be bothered spending two hours with you. I'm either going to get you back to my place in 20 minutes or I'm just going to go get drunk somewhere because I'm seriously sick of this shit. 
I think my I think my record was like eighteen minutes from meeting a girl to having her naked, which is impressive. So much for the what was it the seven to ten hour rule? You just blew that one out of the water. Well, like the seven to ten hour rule, I think that might have been accurate when Mystery was doing his thing, but like I've never actually found that to be a good rule. I did because then it made you focus on the. I think we had an episode on this way early on the time dilation or bridging. Because, yeah, it's seven to 10 hours, but every time you do a bridge, it amplifies time, speed things up. So it gets you focused on that. But that's the thing. It focuses you on the right metric. It's bounced to as many situations as possible so you can build up a rapport. We had five different mini dates. So now we can totally sleep together. It's been 10 hours. Like that fungibility. Oh, yeah. And I would know where you're coming from. But most of the time, like with girls, it was just like the. The first location was the like I just started getting them like it's fuck coffee dates. It was like location with alcohol right away. By the time they're halfway into their first beer, I want her to be thinking I have to finish this beer fast so we can get out of here. <laughs> you literally speed running dates. <laughs> yeah, I know it's kind of kind of insane, but it was just like you, once you get to the point where you're doing that many in that short of a time. You kind of just have to burn through them and just have a because at that point I was all about the metric. I was just trying to hit 50 dates, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, doing 50 first dates is fine. But if you're let's say you're buying the girl a drink and everyone, and or you're having two drinks that are that's a hundred drinks in a month. Yeah. Calorie wise, it has a toll on you, price wise it has a toll on you, just time wise. Liver wise, it has a toll on you. Well, yeah, <laughs> you seem to have one of those fancy livers that regenerates like Wolverine. So I didn't want to bring that up. <laughs> oh, yeah. And like my like I actually had that thing because like I'm not sure if I told you, but like I went partying with like people who were like 20, 20, 20 to 25. I'm like 15 years older than them. <laughs> and like seven of us woke up the next morning and all of them were like, OK, I'm totally destroyed. And I was up there making eggs like, hey, I'm feeling totally fine not hung over at all and the people were like holy shit you, you you're a legend man your liver is just on another level no i'm just practiced <laughs> well you know it's one of those things you notice with younger people they they can bounce back better yeah but you kill them with experience yeah well there's so many little things like i guarantee you, you're probably the only one drinking lots of water before you went to bed maybe even having like an aspirin or ibuprofen beforehand or any of that preparatory stuff yeah, and there's also like uh, this, uh, I can't remember the tablet name at the time, but it's a salt tablet that refills mm -hmm. your salts. Oh. That makes, makes you retain salt. So you take one of those before you go out drinking. Because like most of the time, hangovers come from two things. It's basically dehydration and the fact that you've lost a lot of salt over the night. Yeah, because you're pissing out a lot of salts and you're usually not replenishing them. That's why like the like poutine is like a perfect fucking uh, hang of like food when you're going home. It's like just a bunch of grease and salt. Yeah, fat and salt. The two things a healthy body needs to not die. <laughs> so, oh, that was another one here. Feeling kind of sick. He brought this up. I had a Polish boss. Pickle juice was like his go to like pre hangover drink. And apparently that's like one of the best electrolytes out there. So that's totally on lines with what you're saying, which made me laugh. Thinking well, that, that would kind of make sense, though, with the pickle juice, because like if you do a pickling liquid, it's basically vinegar, salt and sugar. Mm -hmm. For me, I was a huge fan of Eno. I don't do they even have Eno in the States or in Europe? I have no anywhere? idea what Eno is. But it's you know what like Alka-Seltzer is? Or something? It's no, it's like, like Alka-Seltzer, but Eno is just ah, like a powder. Comes in a big thing. You get the fizziness to it. I just got hooked on it and I've drank it so much as a kid. I have like a nostalgic love for the taste now. Even though other people are like, you're drinking baking soda. I'm like, yeah, but it also is good for stomach aches. Well, it's also why I think gin tonic is like a great drink or like mojitos or gin tonics are great. If you're going to do a massive like binge, just on the basis that you're getting probably like two thirds water. Fair versus let, let's let's say if you're going out and you're doing shots you're just getting alcohol but if you're doing like a gin tonic even if it's strong you're at least getting like half water so you're kind of rehydrating as you're going on mm -hmm. also i'm a huge fan of beer because like you don't get those like nasty hangovers from beer you get the stomach hangovers from beer yeah see that's the reason i don't like beer <laughs> i would rather have the nasty headache hangover than the stomach hangover 
Yeah, I'd rather have the stomach hangover over uh, like a nasty headache any day. Yeah, I'll, I can cook and have breakfast with a headache. <laughs> but whatever. I mean, that's it. Um, okay, so we're on, on course here. correction, right? Like, yeah, we got way off course here, so we have to correct ourselves. And if we don't talk about that. drinking with like autistic levels of detail, then what the fuck's the point of even being here? I mean, seriously, really, really? <laughs> yeah, I think but, that's kind of our shtick at this point. Is like drinking, drinking like one oh four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, course correction. Let's use a personal example. Perfect example. Military. After the investigation, a thing came out all fine. Like, let's put aside that. That, no ramifications whatsoever for the weaponized military thing. But I also knew... So you can usually trail somebody's uh, career. You have an ordinary seaman, does his year and a half, or four, or, yeah, two and a half years to get his able seamen. He has to finish his... Uh, OTT package, basically like an on-job training. Then after four years, you get a leading seaman, which is like your, your basic rank. From there, you have to get merited for every additional rank. And that's usually that take your last three years of evaluations and they average them up. And then they rank you guys from like one to however many of them you are. If there's 12 spots, the top 12 people get promoted. That's it. So if you get a particularly bad review one year, it doesn't just mean, oh, I don't get promoted this year. It means the next three years you're going to suffer because everything's always inflated. Everybody's always perfect because there's just way too many people, way too, posi too few positions. So for me, a course correction was once that hit, I had a really bad review because even though none of that stuff mattered, the investigation didn't go anywhere. It was just weaponized, totally unfounded. I had a year under investigation where there was no performance. So they can't write me a good one. So that means, okay, so I'm in for 11 years now. That means it's going to be three more years until I get the next rank, which is Petty Officer Second Class. So that's 12, 13, 14. And that's assuming I get it. And then 15, 16, 17, you can get P1s, which is like a head of department. But then that's like the end of your career. And I'm like, okay, so already this one thing, which didn't even really have enough, like, physical effect in the real world set me back to the point where my career is going to max out at this point, unless I stay in for 50 years, like one of those guys. So bam, course correction. All right. Well then clearly if this is the ceiling of where I'm going to go, if I choose this path then I need to pick a different path. And that's when I left and decided to start getting into corporate finished off the degree in that perfect example of exactly what you're talking about, by the way. And I don't know, like just giving away 12 years and you're like, yep, that's done On to the next thing. I think that's a difficult thing for a lot of people to do just to like cut ties with the life and start again. And I would argue a lot of guys who are averse to changing, to pivoting once they find out something's not going to work out well for them. It's probably because of that. Well, my stance is just generally like people like to get into kind of a groove. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the military, you stay there until you hit retirement. Right. If you're on the, like, there's a reason why so many military guys end up on the police force, because it's kind of like the same kind of mentality, the same type of metrics. They're used to, like the same kind of administration. Yeah. And I think that's, guys get into this like course on the comfort zone and they just never challenge it. And they just kind of go through the motions. Like I know so many military guys who got married just because that meant they could get off base housing. Like, why did you <laughs> marry your girl? Well, you know, I was sick of living in the fucking barracks, man. I know. I was like, oh, that's like the French thing. Find yourself a wife and get yourself a rice rocket. That was always the two things they did. And I was like, oh, you poor. That would explain why every French senior enlisted official always had like three divorces under his belt. I'm like, dude, you're just getting to, you're just getting married for the benefits, except for you're getting divorced and realizing, oh, I'm not a chick. I can't get prizes. <laughs> So for me, it's more like you have to dial down those metrics and you have to also be very honest with yourself about where you want to end up. Like if you're staying in the military for 30 years, once you get out, unless you got into those like high ass ranks where you're like a, a major, a colonel, a general at that level, you're going to go into either security or law enforcement for the most part. And mm -hmm. like Ryan went IT security, but a lot of the people end up like either law enforcement or they end up as bodyguards or something. Yeah. And you have to be comfortable with that path and being ruthlessly honest with yourself about that path is going to be difficult. Like the whole reason why I decided to go into uh, consulting was just that I saw that, okay, you know what, you can actually make a lot more money doing the exact same job and you can actually switch if you're getting bored with crap. 
because everyone right. who's worked like in in like a public sector thing knows that over time you're going to spend 80 percent of your time doing administration and about 20 percent if you're lucky doing the thing that you actually like about your job because no one likes dealing with public administrators Matt. nope public administrators the meetings all of it it's all just it almost feels like a giant make work project like everybody kind of justifying why I'm here because the public sector for the most understand. parts automates stuff and then you don't really have to work and it's very hard to change anything because people have that comfort rut, which is fine. I, I mean, you get a paycheck, you go home. If you want to build yourself a better life that way, power to you. But I think it comes down to like, do you actually want to enjoy those eight to 10 hours you're going to spend at work every day? Or do you want, are you comfortable with being miserable for those, those eight hours? in order to uh, facilitate what you're doing for the other eight when you're not sleeping. Hey, and that was where my pivot to this came. It was the same thing. The money was much better. All of a sudden I went from like 80 grand to hundred grand to 10, uh, 110 grand. I'm like, oh, this switch is awesome. But then between the commute and the job, especially startups, I would never ever work for a startup again. I just, it's too dysfunctional for me. But uh, yeah, then I'm like, okay, so that's great. I come home with like $10,000 a month, but I'm spending it mostly on booze and trinkets to kind of prep me to go into work the next day and not hate myself. So I'm like, no, no, I don't think I want the money either. To be fair, the booze and trinkets are awesome, man. Yeah, they're nice. I mean, it's how I got this camera that I'm filming on right now. It was just literally, I was bored. So I'm like, I'm going to go film something. I'm going to buy a camera, <laughs> throw three grand on it. But then I was thinking like, if I'm if I need to spend three grand a month, to tolerate the 10 grand a month I was doing working. Why not just leave, do something I want to do for like seven grand a month? You know what I mean? So like, I don't have to, I don't get that premium, but that's just picking a bad metric. If I pick the dollar amount at the end of the day as the, as the metric I want to go with, then yeah, I wouldn't really care how miserable I was as long as the bank account looked bigger. Yeah, well, it's kind of the same disagreement that I've been having with, um, you know, Mark Allen Bouvoir. The guy who does like the, uh, he has a really good Twitter for uh, financial advice. Ooh, what's this guy's name again? Uh, Mark Allen Bouwar. Oh, that Twitter guy. Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I think he's, he's unlocked me lately, which is good. Yeah, he, he, well, he was one of those uh, people with uh, Upstream. Yeah. But uh, he actually has a lot of value in his channel. And one of, but one of the disagreements we've had is like, he, he's like a big, here's how you cut your costs and save more thing. And mm -hmm. for me, like, I always find it much easier just to make more money. Yeah. Well, there's no ceiling to it as opposed to the cutting costs. Because like, for me, it's like, it, it's a lot easier to earn a hundred grand extra than it is to save like 50% of my salary. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to get to the point where I'm making so enough money that almost regardless of what I do, there's some left in the account at the end of the month. That's the dream most people don't have. But see, and I, I don't mind the minimalist thing either. But for me, it's not about saving money. It's not like the financial incentive. For me, I just hate doing things that I don't want to do. I hate buying things that I'm not going to use. I hate owning things that are more of a pain in the ass than that. So for me, minimalism is just more about having a problem-free life. So yeah, part of that's going to involve, like you said, cutting costs and that, because I mean, what do I need for seven Spotify accounts if I don't even listen to the damn thing? You know what I mean? But I just don't get how like the financial scarcity is the main motivator to that. That's the part I'm with you. I don't agree on that side of it at all. Well, like I like minimalism too. Like don't buy shit you won't need. And I think that's one of the funnier things that the second you introduce a girl in your life, yeah, then suddenly you get a lot more shit that you don't need yeah and it's it could be anything you could pick up like a best friend you could be a gay dude and then end up grabbing another guy it's just an entire other human being of course twice as many dishes in the house when you're used to cleaning up this many now you have twice as many that's why all of a sudden everything seems like such a burden having this other person around well it's, yeah it's just because there's an extra person there and I will forbid, say they're not an accessory well, sometimes you do get some innovation from it, but for the most part, it's just extra shit. Like, yeah, you, you have to have two times as many things, and you have to have two times as many useless things. Mm -hmm. Because everyone has a couple of useless things they have there for nostalgia, or because, like, let, if we do cooking as an example, like, everyone who learned cooking from, like, their mother or grandmother 
has like two, three things they don't need, but they're there because their mother or grandmother always had that shit in her house. So you have yeah. that in there in your house. Like I have 18 times as many spices as I technically need because I only use about seven. <laughs> But, but grandma have, wanted like, you to have saffron, and god damn it, you're gonna have saffron. Well, that's not a grandma thing, that's just like a general thing. Like when you try out a new recipe, and suddenly you go from like my go to spices, and I realize this is off topic is basically uh, black pepper, salt, uh, garlic powder, onion powder, red pepper flakes, oregano, basil, and uh, thyme. Those are like the basic eight. Wow, I don't think I have most of those. For me, it's but five then, spice, five spice, and get, like chipotle. But then you get into it, and you're like, okay, suddenly you have like eight different kinds of fucking salt. Like you have like your salt grinder with rock salt. You have your flaked sea salt for when you're cooking a steak. You have your pickling like, salt. Pickling salt, you have your um, what's it called? The uh, koshering salt, and you have like eight different types of salt. And then suddenly you start cooking, like let's say you start cooking something Asian, and suddenly you're gonna need that five spice, you're going to need some probably cardamom, you're gonna need what's it called? The uh, all spice, and you have like 18 different spices you need, and yeah, you, know, you buy them because they're cheap, but suddenly you have like a cabinet full of that shit that you don't technically need. Oh, and wait till you start getting into Indian food. Holy crap. We've got like at least 20 spices or various like curried spices. Cloves, fennel, garam masala, turmeric. Like, yeah, the list goes on and on. But then you kind of get into real What's that? When did you realize you were off course though with your spices? I realized I was off course when I saw spices like the jars started to collect dust. Like I've had the same jar of saffron since 2008. Hasn't gone bad, but it's just been sitting there. I'm like, I never use this. And uh, we had like pine nuts, which we never cook with. And yeah, just one day I realized I was looking for something I needed and I had to wade through so much of the crap I didn't need. I'm like, what the hell? And so we literally, we were moving from Montreal to Toronto at the time. So we just started throwing out food. Yeah, like I was doing the same thing like the other day because I decided to kind of go through all my shit. Mm -hmm. And like suddenly you find that, oh, right, I have like 18 jars of cumin here. <laughs> and I fucking hate cumin. Really? Yeah, for me, like it, cumin just smells like sweat to me. I wonder, is that like how asparagus, there's certain people that have those wrong receptors and to them it tastes like or it uh, makes their pee smell or... What's the other yeah, one? Cilantro. Some people taste like it tastes like soap to them. Well, cilantro, I think, is nice, but I, I've noticed with cilantro, it's like it's very hit and miss. Because I don't think you can cook Mexican food without cilantro. Right. Well, you can't. But because they put cilantro in fucking everything, it's kind of like Asians and chili, like, like, or Indians are even worse. Like, Indians even have fucking spicy desserts, man. Yeah. Yeah, that sweet savory mix. I've never been a fan of that, but whatever. They seem to like it. And at some point, you just find out that like you're kind of lost because you were trying to go from A to B, which was basically, okay, I need to cook good food. And then on your way to, okay, I'm able to actually cook good food, you accumulated so much shit that you don't actually have space to cook anymore. But yeah, well, it basically, you burned out the same way you did with work or with uh, you know whatever else you were doing. You went... Full hog, you learn exactly where your limits are, and then you kind of scale it back to something you're more comfortable with, like that 80% level where, yeah, I can't make the fanciest of Asian dishes, but I've got the main four spices I need that'll handle 90% of the things I want to make. Bird chilies, your five spice, your cloves, garlic, done. Or with Mexican, as long as you have some sort of pepper, maybe like a cayenne, jalapeno, uh what's the other one cilantro and like you said that's it that gets me 90 percent of the way there and i'm good enough with that like you make that sacrifice that oh my god it's not hipster quality tacos because you're missing you know smoked or what do they call them yeah you're missing that perfect jalapeno pepper or the poblano but you're like whatever i don't care i don't need to have well, most in my fridge at all times no but like there are some things though like the big things i found with like if you're thinking Mexican and Asian food, if you like those two, which I do, 
Mm -hmm. then there are certain overlaps. Like as long as you have like a hot pepper of some kind. Yeah. And you have lime and you have fresh cilantro. You're going to be able to cover a very wide range. Oh, huge. Range. Of course, you're going to you're going to need some kind of condiments. But like I, I started using fish sauce. I only used it in like my curries. But I've started adding that to all kinds of random shit because it it doesn't taste fishy and it adds that umami flavor to everything. Yeah, it's like it's like MSG where it's just instant uh what's it savory. Or I guess yeah, umami. Savory, they don't call umami. It savory. Same thing. No, savory it? umami is the same thing. Yeah, uh, MSG was the one I've been picking up on lately. Like little bit. I started I've just started throwing shit away and it's like same thing with the fridge and same thing with the plates for that matter. Like you tend to accumulate them as well. Like at one point I was spinning like seven or eight plates at once, and that's just too much fucking work, man. Oh, I thought it was like, is he talking about flatware or about girls? <laughs> no, I was actually I was trying to bring it back to girls now. And for me, that was just like I found like the perfect number of plates is between three and five. Some guys on my Patreon go as low as like two, three at max. But I mean that's everybody has their limit of where they want to do it. Well, for me, it's more like three three to five is like the most, like five is pushing it. Three is getting a bit too, like, into the sketch zone. Because if you want abundance, you want more than two. Because two girls can be on their period at the same time. If you have three, the odds of them being on their period or being pissed at you at the same time is very low. But once you start hitting five, you start running into those logistics challenges where you're mixing up names, you're mixing up what girls you told what story to, <laughs> you're mixing up like uh, suddenly you start to find a random underwear in your house or like one guy is trying to kind of push in, one girl is trying to move shit into your house and you're not catching it because you're too busy trying to clean up for the next plate. Then like I had one who used so much fucking perfume that I had to wash my sheets like twice a week before the other girl was coming over just because it was a pain. Like you can't have your sheets smelling a fucking Chanel. Yeah. When the other girl comes over, that's just not going to fly. Well, I was thinking more love spots on it would probably be a bad idea too. But then again, girls are savagely filthy lately, so they probably wouldn't even care. <laughs> well, <laughs> Definitely I mean, the scent of another girl on it. <laughs> well, that kind of depends on like the, type of girl you're hitting up and like for me it was never about like i always had a thing for i want girls who have like an education have a career uh are decently self-confident but have slight confidence issues that you can play off so like well what's the underlying issue for that for a plate like why does that even matter for you you mean the career thing or the uh yeah all that stuff you just thing. described because basically hot and available is like baseline girl well, the career about. thing and have some things going for is just because I can't stand dumb fucking girls. Ah, okay. So that makes sense. Like, I, I just don't like, I, I just never could get into like, okay, if you're doing a one night stand, fair enough. You don't actually, the only thing you care about is her being smart enough to realize that she shouldn't bite when she's blowing you. That's like the top level of intelligence you're looking for at that kind of girl. <laughs> but if you're actually going to associate with someone over a period of time, I'd like them to be able to open their mouth without it being nails on a fucking chalkboard to me. All right. So yeah, you're just basic human sock puppet bitch management. That's like the level. Oh, it's going to sound autistic, but that's like the level one past the one night stand actually gets you for a decent amount of time. All right. That makes sense. Plus like, let's say you're spending with like uh, two to three hours like most of the time when like i never did like the whole come over let's fucking get the fuck out thing mm -hmm. i always like preferred to actually spend some time with them and at that point you're going to need them to have some kind of level of experience that they actually have shit to talk about carry a conversation on whatever topic i want to talk about don't and make me want to stab myself in the neck with a fork i get you i get you yeah and the confidence versus insecurity is just like that's the truth for any kind of long-term relationship you want your girl to be confident enough that you don't have to like i had a plate at one point who had like she was like a petri dish of every kind of she had anxiety she had depression uh, a couple other things and she was crazy so she was really good in bed specifically because she was crazy yeah 
at the same time, the craziness in bed was kind of oversh overshadowed by the fact that you had to spend so much time managing her emotions. <laughs> That's the abundance of you, though. Like, yeah, I can get... 90% of laid like this. It's like your spice cabinet. That's the spice cabinet girl. Do I really need fennel seeds right now? No, sorry, madam. I can make a perfectly good dish with salt and pepper over here. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, to be honest, though, it's also like, at one point, if you have a girl that's that crazy, she's going to push a couple, like, I knew that it, it had gone too far. I, I want you to punch me in the face closed fist while we're having sex. And at that point, I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna I'm get out. I'm gonna I'm go. <laughs> All right, I gotta get you to carry for a second. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go tinkle. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Come on. No, so that was always like my reasoning behind it was, you have to if you figure out what you want, then you can kind of meaningfully plot a course. But. If you don't actually know where you want to go, then you end up kind of going all over the place. Like you see the guys, if you, I'm not sure how many of you follow uh, Twitter. Visualizing Carl as SpongeBob. Nice. I'm out. out. No, but in, in my case, it's just like if you determine those preferences, you kind of know what you actually want to deal with. So at that point, you know how to plot your course and you'll automatically know when you're off so i prefer like just go out and do whatever strikes your fancy at a given time and then over time as you grow older you'll develop a certain set of preferences that you can actually work with and at that point you just want to test those preferences like uh, i'm more comfortable these days to where i'm uh, uh chilling and I'm just doing my own thing and I can get too comfortable in that you start to enjoy life a little bit too much you put on a couple pounds you drink a little bit too much and then you just kind of figure it out because like I'm doing this show hungover as fuck because my social calendar has been extremely full and I realized that okay I'm kind of have to cut back on my social calendar because like my old ass can't handle this high frequency of this hard partying like the when i was 20 i could go on like an after party and stay until seven o'clock in the morning if i do that now i'm kind of destroyed for two days so it's just like let's see we have a question here from commander heavy gunman <laughs> if you know what if you know where oh, yeah, you want to, to he's supposed oh to yeah, some tell me some cocksucker you. just put a cock in chat. Never mind, uh, Carl. If you know where you want to be and having a hard time getting the first few steps, what could you do? I'm going to put this to you, Ryan. What do you think? What where like if you know where you want to go, but you're having a hard time figuring out how to get started, what would you do? Well, obviously the problem is my own stupid brain, so I just stop thinking and do something, and I just accept that whatever I'm going to do is going to screw it up. I'm going to screw this up, but I'm going to go screw that up like right now. Because then at least I'll know something more at the end of it. As long as it's not screwed up to the point where I end up in prison, right? Like, I don't know how to do Twitch. So what did I do? I need to learn how to do another platform. I went on Twitch. I put on a thing. Guys are like, hey, just so you know, there's like eight things you should have done right now when first starting. I'm like, hey, thanks. People are more than happy to correct you. That's half of engagement at Twitter. Like, Carl, wasn't it you telling me that every now and then you put out a tweet with a spelling mistake just so like eight people will try to correct your spelling in there and you give you a ton of engagement? Oh, yeah. And that was yeah. something me, Ed, and Illuminable Man came up with a while back that, like, the one, the tweets, our tweets, the ones that went the most viral were the mm -hmm. ones we had spelling mistakes because they got some extra traction and engagement just because people were correcting us. Same thing with controversial shit. Like, I logged on yesterday. Let me check my analytics for Twitter. I think I had a tweet that went kind of hard yesterday with engagement. Nice. Because I know what I like, I don't even tweet anymore. Almost like I, I log on to mostly like check out has brother Morpheus done something funny. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Here's the tweet from yesterday. I had a 14% engagement rate. Damn, that's good. I don't think I've ever gotten that 30, 36,000 um, impressions so far just for tweeting out like, quote, I never drank, end quote. Equals lamer, boring person, no good stories. Uh, quotation mark, I used to drink, but I stopped because I sort of had to. End quote. Equals awesome, fun person, fucking insane stories. 
And you, you know, it's true because like you never get the good stories from teetotalers, but the guys who were like, yeah, I used to be, I'm a non-drinker now. I've been in the program for 14 years because I used to like do Coke with the, at Studio 54 with River Phoenix. That was actually there, there when the dude fucking died. And I tried to help him, but I was so hammered. I couldn't actually figure out where my mouth was to give him mouth to mouth. Those guys have awesome stories. Yeah. So for me, that's more like a experience thing. Because I think that's the main thing with like you, me, and Troy, especially. Like with the Rich and Rolo to some extent too. It's like they're... All of us are guys who had a very wide range of experience. Like, Rolo's worked corporate. He's been a musician. He's currently doing his own thing. Like, Rich has his current business, but he's also worked for other people. He's been unsuccessful in some things. He's gone through a divorce. He has a daughter that he's raising as kind of a single dadish thing. The dude was actually crazy enough to marry a divorce lawyer, you know, and you just have a panel that has a lot of wide-ranging experience. And I think that's why the conversations also work. Because everyone has, like, a wide range, but slightly different experience. Like, you have more experience in the military than any of the other. Like, some of us have some, but not as much as you. Right. But Rich knows way more about business, and I'm, like, clueless on half of that. Yeah, and, like, I can Rich play the always guitar, has that eye. <laughs> yeah, but Rich has that eye on monetization. All the time. And at the same time, John is like the youngest one of us, I think. Which is crazy when you think about it. Because he's like 32, 33, isn't he? Yeah, We're but at the same like time, though, like, <laughs> Yeah, but like, I get the impression with John that he's a lot younger than he actually is. Hmm. Most of the time. But he's very, very good at the marketing. And he, he hustles hard. So he kind of makes the rest of us hustle hard. Well, not me, because I couldn't give a shit. But the rest of you it makes the rest of you hustle harder. I think a lot of the business thing you've done is because of Rich and John. Just John has been kind of pushing you to hustle more. And Rich is the guy who's like, okay, why aren't you doing this no brainer thing to make more money? No, I agree. What's wrong Dude, with you? I mean, you've been in the chats. You see how often behind the scenes, John's staying to stop thinking like one of the pores. <laughs> and then give me some like here just do this and stop wasting your time i'm like all right fair enough <laughs> i may not do it but at least i know that's a thing i can do well like we had a discussion with twitch is like the only reason we're doing twitch is so i don't get ryan demonetized by uh swearing that's right fuck 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 de fuck fuck <laughs> but like for me it's more like i i do this because i think it's like some guy commented that in the chat at some point that all the other guys treat this like a business Carl treats the audience and the other guys as his entertainment it's good and it, and it's sort of true because I like what I'm doing here but at the same time I'm not going to take it seriously enough that I have to start being professional on some level well you kind of inspire me on that one too as much as John pushes me on the marketing thing I realize, like, I see the guys who treat this super serious, 100% business, and then they become more plastic and manufactured, and then that's where platitudes start coming in. They're taking Ambien to sleep at night, but meanwhile, they're coming on here talking about saving the West. I'm like, dude, you can't even save your prescription. But, like, a little bit of a reverence, I think, is a nice thing. It's very, and I hate to use this word because everybody loves using it, like authenticity. And it has a well, bit I of that luxury branding where it's like i don't need you guys as customers i have other options and so i can be more honest with people even if well, it does hurt think, their feelings well i think that's important though because like me and um rule zero dad Corey, he's been on here a few times on the youtube one most polite asshole nice uh, but and me and him had a conversation about this that you always want to be in the position where you can fire a client yeah and that, that's just because of your own peace of mind. Like, if he gets it because he's a lawyer. I get it because of what I do. And at some point, you want to be able to tell people, like, you know what? I like your money, but I can't stand working with you. So please fuck off. <laughs> Give them to your competition. <laughs> you and, can have and them. You, and you also develop that ability. It's kind of funny, but uh, I can't remember who had this quote, but... It's an art to be able to tell someone to go to hell and making them look forward to the trip. Ooh, speaking of that, uh, one of the guys over 60 from the Married Red Pill gave me a great strategy for that. 
when somebody's arguing with you about how you're wrong and they're right and you're an ass and they're great. It's like, man, thanks for trying, but I don't think you can save me. And then usually most guys are so ego invested. They're like, yeah, that's right. I crushed him. But anybody who's got half a brain looks at that and goes, I think he just told him to go pound sand. <laughs> Wonderful line for that, by the way. I don't think you can help me, man. <laughs> thanks, though, for trying. <laughs> I do like the pound sand thing, though. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, more often than not, the guy should pound sand. But I, what? and I, to bring that back, I think it's because I, what I was talking about when you were off um, treating your prostate was essentially that as you develop experience, you also develop a degree of discernment and you actually learn what you don't want. And yeah, we've talked about that before. And I think that's the most important point is learning what you don't want because like i've started to do that now like when i was a teenager it's like you want everyone you want to be the popular guy right like right now no i i just act the way i do on here in real life for the most part because i'm actually actively trying to get people to fuck out of my circle of acquaintances yeah and the ones that can handle that i don't know what i want to say that roughness of you or that way of thinking those are the ones you want in there. So you're just filtering them. It's like literally mode one for life. Yeah. So, and the same thing with work. Like the second a job starts being too much of a pain in the ass for me, I just find another one. And at the same time, I have a business on the side that's making a couple of million a year. So I could comfortably live off that. But at the same time, I've hired people to actually handle most of that stuff, except the accounts. So mm -hmm. it's, just a comfortable way of doing it and just developing those income streams. Like I have a little bit of income from like, I love getting my like uh, things from Amazon with um, the whole thing. Like, Oh, here are your residuals for this, uh, for this month. It's not a huge amount, but it keeps me in a couple of good bottles of scotch every month. Yeah. And worst case scenario, I could see if you like lost everything, your house burned down, no insurance, whatever, that little bit of residual could be that what that helps to get you going again like to get you out of the dumpster and into at least a one bedroom apartment. You know what I mean? Like that safety net. Yeah. And like, I always know that like, if I wanted to, I could monetize much wider uh, because I think only Rolo has a larger account than I do on Twitter, among other things. But at yeah. the same time, like I put literally very little effort into it. I wish I could write more, but it's more about when I write something, I want it to be something that's new and something that's original rather than being a repetition of something I've done before. So Gendernomics 1 and Gendernomics 2, they were kind of original works. Like I don't think anyone had ever written books like that in this space. No, I would say definitely not. Because there's not gonna... people don't understand economics in this space. That's probably why. <laughs> but like I'm not gonna do a gender I'm probably going to end up doing a gendernomics three at some point. But at that point it's going to be because I see something or I get inspired to do it because it's something I legit want to do rather than okay, this is a cheap money grab. Like that's what I love about uh, Rolo's um fourth book, um The Red Pill and Religion. Right. Is that the fact that he's taking this long to actually write it and research it and put it out means that that book is definitely going to be worth reading even for his um, regular audience. I hope so. I really do. Because then again, I was also, I remember the old shovelware years. Uh, what was it? Uh, Half-Life 3. 10 years later, or Duke Nukem. 10 years later. All right, we finally got it. And you're like, what the hell is this? I'm sure he's fine. <laughs> but that's always oh, in the I, back of my mind. Well, that's also what I've been kind of having issues with. Because if you talk about courses, like our good friend Hacksaw Jim Duggan is obviously threading water a bit, man. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not talking shit because I actually like dude. But yeah. from my perspective, like it's obvious that he doesn't quite know where he wants to go with his thing. Well, that was the problem with Duggan is that everybody like there was a bunch of people that wanted him to succeed. And then there was a bunch of people that were filling his ego. And I think he kind of went to that side because it felt better. But then the problem is when nothing came out of that, that's where the floundering came through. And so I'm just whatever. Eventually, you got to let him have his own two by four at justice, you know? Yeah, but if you're talking about authenticity, it's not <laughs> about what name you're writing under. It's about who you are when you're actually producing your content. Like, I don't pander. I've 
like you don't pander to your audience either. Like all the guys that actually like in this space are people, they don't pander to their audience. They're not trying to create fake scarcity, Yeah. but they are direct and on some level brutally honest. And I think that's what a lot of people are actually lacking because if you go back in time, we used to have like really good feedback mechanisms for when you fucked up. Yeah. Your dad would beat your ass. A tiger would, would fire beat you. you. Boss would fire. Yeah. Boss would fire you. And you have all these mechanisms to kind of like, okay, we are doing this to actually help you. And that's kind of gone now because everyone's pandering. Like you wouldn't have all this pandering bullshit either. If we hadn't had like a self-esteem movement. Oh my God. I know rule zero dad fucking, coming in with the fire this morning. Uh, like Corey logs into the chat and he's like Molotov. <laughs> no, I agree. That's the thing. And what it mattered too, like you said, back before we had, you know, rifles and civilization, a tiger would eat you if you screwed up. So there was a real incentive not to be a screw up. And we've done so well at making things so safe that they're, like I, I am surprised every year we keep pushing the envelope as to how badly we can do anything and not die. And every year I'm surprised that you're like, no, 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 watch this. Like we got the point now where we're literally saying, hey, you know what? We're going to close down 90% of the country for like a year and then pay them out of the treasury and we'll be fine. And so far I'm like, well, it's not wrong. Like nobody's dying yet. I'm just I absolutely mean, think... amazed how far how well we managed to make ourselves prosperous to the point where we can't kill ourselves, even if we try. Well, you know the Australia meme, right? What's that? Well, you post a meme and then under it, it's like a picture of some wildlife from Australia. And like, regardless of what the top part is, it's always like, meanwhile, in Australia, something's trying to kill you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know the one. And it's kind of the same thing that I think we want struggle. We want to actually have some negative feedback from the world, but we have to go to such an extreme extent to actually get it now. Imagine it's being that a... Raz Simone guy too. He's like literally insurrection and created his own small government within the country. And even then they're like, all right, fine. You'll have your fun. Then go off, finish that SoundCloud album. Like you can't even get people mad for that. Yeah, and I think it's just, it, it goes to the acceptance and the self-esteem movement, but at the same time, man, I think we want to kind of see idiots get a punch in the face. We we kind of want that. It's cathartic. It lets you know there's a just world out there, and the bad guy gets his comeuppance, and the stupid people get stupid. Because that justifies us. Well, I'm a hard worker, and I pay my taxes. The rules, I'm playing by the rules, so I want to see the examples of the rules working. Well, to be honest, though, like I, I see it as a citizen's duty to pay as little taxes as humanly possible. Wasn't that the whole point of incentives? Well, you know, it's also part of the reason why I'm in my current field, because the way I figure it, if I mainly build the public sector, mm -hmm. then I can get my taxes back. <laughs> T taxes back and consultant fees? Well, That's so I, I just I just had to pay back taxes this year. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I build the public sector for a month of work that I didn't actually do a ton of work. And just to make my taxes back. Hey, you know what? It works. But that's the thing, too. So there's a difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance. One's illegal. The other one's perfectly legal. Not only is it legal, the whole point of the tax code is to incentivize certain behaviors. So the argument goes, if you're avoiding as much tax as you can, then you're technically acting in the way that government has kind of designed. It acts in the best interest of the country. That's the theory. Now, obviously, you map that to the terrain. It may not map out perfectly, but whatever. If it didn't exist, and even if that law, some tax avoidance law you're using, even if it's there and it shouldn't be there, the only way that's going to get changed is if somebody drives a truck through that. So if anything, you have to, you have to really point out a problem by uh, min-maxing a problem. Otherwise, everybody will be like, oh, it's just a cost of doing business. You yeah, know what funnily I mean? enough, though, that's like a big thing with, um, like, a, to make a World of Warcraft reference here, there was a bug, well, not a bug, but there was a thing where we could queue to a, like, there's, you have two types of queues for Battlegrounds, right? Uh, right? Player versus player. There is the solo queue, and you have the group queue. Mm-hmm. 
And one of the battlegrounds were designed to only be solo queue. So if you wanted to play that one, you had to queue into it alone. All the other ones you could queue with a full group, but this one you can't. Okay. But a bunch of us figured out that if you actually time the time you click getting queue thing, we could all get into the same one. And that worked fine for like two weeks until everyone figured out that out. And then like tens of thousands of people started doing that. And then suddenly it's fixed immediately because at that point the problem became big enough that have an impact. there was enough yeah there was enough noise made about it that people actually had to do, that the developer actually had to do something about it. And I agree with you on that. Like you kind of have to kind of prove how dumb a law is to actually have it changed. Mm -hmm. No, obviously, and then this is going to sound horrible from an ethical perspective, but you know somebody is going to do it. Might as well be me, which is exactly what fraudsters justify their actions with there's some truth like, to it yeah one of my favorite stories I've, i heard was about like this guy who you know when they have like the gulf war right they closed down like the uh, uh, canal that they used to transport oil from the middle east to europe and the america oh the straits of hormuz there or do you mean yeah. the suez um uh, not the suez the suez is in um, south america right no no that's panama suez is the egyptian one yeah, it's the one between Egypt and Iran, and Iraq there. Oh, so you're, yeah, Straits of Hormuz. Yeah, they closed that one down, and they're like, no transport ships are allowed to go through here. And one dude was like, I'm going to send all my transport ships down there. And even if half of them get bombed, I'll make enough money on the 50% that doesn't to make a fucking killing. Yeah, because I remember that spiked oil prices there for a bit too, didn't it? Yeah, but at the same time, though, there was, like, laws in place that if you actually did that, then you could actually legit be charged with, you know, not murder, but manslaughter, et cetera, for sending people in there to die on the transport ship that got bombed. Mm -hmm. And the guy actually got charged with it. Mm. And they sat down with, like, 30 lawyers, and they had a meeting, and they were like, well, the average police detective sticks with the job for 10 years, then they start doing something else. If we're able to slow this case down to the point where it goes through like three or four detectives, they will have lost enough evidence that we have enough room to work with to get the dude acquitted. And they actually got the guy off. Fair enough. Like, no legal changes to it, but I, I just think it's a very funny story when you're actually getting to the point where like, Okay, we're just going to wait for three detectives to retire because the cops are incompetent enough to lose enough evidence that we can actually get the case dismissed just based off a lack of evidence. Yeah, it's like power to them, I guess. It sucks if you're one of those ship captains that got blown, but or blown up, but yeah, it's kind, it's kind of a uh, it's a sidetrack. But like, have we ever stayed on topic while doing these podcasts? Well, that's why we switched to themes, because we found when we did a topic, it was too hard to stay on the topic because we'd mine the entire thing and then we kind of go off on a tangent and meet it. But then when we got a theme, it works much better because we kind of everything that's surrounding it, but then we'll eventually come back to the center. Yeah, but I, it's always been like I've had this like idea. Oh, holy shit. ADJ's persistent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with those sorry, in chat. And I wouldn't worry about that. And Dick's in the chat, man. <laughs> no, but like we had a dude at a good point further up here he said um let's see here that was not rule zero dad yeah he has good points but it wasn't him i was looking for before all those dicks uh there was said, an like, anti-government thing too yeah he basically said that once you start pandering oh yeah uh, you lose the audience you, start, you lose the audience and i think pandering is natural once you start dialing in a given brand and you want to live that brand as opposed to like being a guy who's just there. Yeah. I think that's why it was impossible for me to lose followers, even how hard I tried. Because the well, more I tried to lose them, the more people were like, holy crap, I actually want to follow this guy. Like, he's, he's banned new followers. Let's just spam his inbox. Like, hey, huge fan. Can I please, can you please let me follow you? It's <laughs> the most insane thing I've ever had in my life. Like, I had a, thousand people like please follow me please let me follow you it's like i had to open my twitter just because it was too much of a pain in the ass to manually allow people to follow i just couldn't deal with that workload man yeah i know you had that purge going for a while didn't work out but that's 
It's the same thing that I always said when I was going back to corporate and I'm like, I got a sailor mouth, whatever. I sit there, I cuss a little bit and that was me from day one. And so everybody kind of put up with it and laughed and, oh, it was kind of funny. My one boss, a very soft spoken man, he's like, oh, you shouldn't really do that. You can never do that. I'm like, no, you can't do that. Like I can, because everybody's used to it. And then why is he cussing so much? Oh, he just came out of the Navy. Like people just need a story to wrap around it. But then that's not me like pandering, pandering would me start being soft spoken and acting like that. And I think people can tell when you're pandering and their initial instinct is to assume what does this asshole want from me? Which makes I sense. So Same too. as dating. If you start pandering to a girl, Oh, you're so sweet. Oh, that's hilarious. Your jokes are hilarious. You're probably gonna look at him going, yeah, I'm not fucking this guy. I don't trust it. Oh. No, but I agree with you. I think that's kind of like the downside of once you start thinking more about what the other person wants or prefers than what do you prefer? Like, I, I just can't stand moderating myself. So I've kind of over time, I've kind of ended up in a niche that actually suits my personality. Same thing yeah. with this stuff. It's like I, I just kind of I took some advice early on, like Mike Cernovich before he went complete right wing had some good advice. I got some good advice from IM based on Twitter and the blog and stuff. But mm -hmm. over time, it's just kind of been I'm doing my own thing just on. Can I be bothered following this advice? Can I be bothered pandering to an audience? No, not so much. Yeah, well, Blue Ocean. It's exactly what we talked about on the Red Ocean, Blue Ocean episode. The Red Ocean episode is the pandering one because everybody's there. There's a certain set of expectations. That's why some idiot at 530 in the morning will post some stupidity. And then 30 accounts are commenting on it by the end of the day. So then you're just by the way, are you a likable asshole here? In your case, it was the blue ocean. You know what? I'm doing this thing and it's my thing. And if you don't like it, fuck you. And then other people are drawn to that. And then but the only way to be um, you and yours is to be more creative and have a different thing. But uh, you know, speaking about the leaning in, leaning out, and whatever, I mean, are you leaning in or out while you're tanning your asshole, man? <laughs> <laughs> Did now, you see uh, Wang, by the way, is a guy I follow on uh, YouTube? who uh his name is wang it's hold on a sec i'll pull up his youtube channel anyways he does he did plays guitar he has long hair giant curly mustache he actually he was the guy that uh did the made uh deads and sushi go viral with her photos what photos she went well, viral? She, every one of her selfies was the exact same pose and so he just made a comment oh. like oh, hilarious this girl hasn't changed position in like 10 years and that's where she got all that hate had to like private her account briefly there yeah, I was just trying to find the. Uh, there he yeah, is, he actually right. has a point. All, all, all the same. All the selfies are like the exact same pose. Yeah, there he is, Justin Wang. It was I was talking to him before, and it's hilarious because he's also the one that, like, as soon as we started talking about the green line thing, he was immediately on there too. So that got far and wide reach, which was kind of interesting. And his point was the same at ours. It's like, dude, how autistic do you have to be to the point where you're measuring girls' like percentage of lean to well, know if you're a man or not? That I do kind of think that's a big issue with our course, though, in this space, that a lot of it is so rigid. And, like, part of the reason why it's rigid is to avoid people doing dumb shit. Yeah. But, but there's very the few things time, that need it. Like, the whole point is, like, over time, you're supposed to get rid of that rigidity as you figure things out. Like, I don't follow most of my own fucking advice when it comes to game. Mm -hmm. But you're past it. Like, that's why well, it's, it's advice like, now and not just wish fulfillment. It's like the whole reason why it's like the two thirds rule for texts. It's like always wait how long she waited plus X, whatever. Mm -hmm. The whole reason for that is you're not to seem too available and you have to like not spam her because that way she realizes you're sitting at home, have nothing to do and you're playing with your dick as opposed to like, she has no idea what you're doing. Yeah. And who you're doing it with. <gasps> Yeah, it's the same thing. Like, uh, my girl's been bothering me. Like, hey, can you please send me pictures or tell me what you're doing during the day? And I'm like, no. <laughs> Surprised you did the courtesy of saying no. Well, I didn't say no, but I just oh, you just started. yeah, you just said no to but yourself. There, there are two. There are two ways of dealing with things. Like, there is the normal way. You can do whatever someone tells you. Mm -hmm. You can not do when someone tells you, or you can troll them. Those are like the three ones. And the trolling one is the one I always default to. You really did not see that. <laughs> it's like if someone tells me like you have to follow this rule, then I will follow that rule extremely closely. 
like I had at one point, like one of my former employers were like, we're starting like an automatic punch clock thing. So you're going to have to punch in whenever you're working. And then my you boss at like me. an Amazon loading trucks. No, no, <laughs> this was this was like a normal like knowledge business, and uh, like and I was like, okay, fine, I think this is stupid, but I'll do it. And then next time my boss called me at like in the middle of the working hours. No, like uh, right outside of working hours, but we had a huge like tech crash, so there was a lot of things that had to be fixed, right? Or there was going to be a lot of millions lost. My boss calls me, and I'm like, okay, well, I'll call you back in two minutes. I just have to punch in first, and I hung up. <laughs> punched in and called him back. <laughs> I don't know and why that, that makes me laugh so much. <laughs> and after that, there was like never, I never had to punch in ever again. <laughs> there, Johnny's got it. Malicious compliance. Yeah. Yeah, malicious compliance, but it's malicious compliance plus humor because malicious compliance is essentially working to rule essentially mm -hmm. or bending the rule to the furthest extent you can this is my approach is malicious compliance plus making fun of the person who's trying to enforce the rule by highlighting how stupid they are for thinking this should be a rule dude that's absolutely wonderful that's it belongs that belongs in a museum <laughs> Ooh, I like this zero's coming with the uh with the heavy ammo but I mean, at the end of the day, back to the topic, it all boils down to what your metrics are. And your metric is like, I don't want to deal with bullshit. I just don't because it's it gets in the way of doing the things I actually want to do. So when you got that, what do you do about it? In like your case, you just want to poke fun at it, poke fun at it and be completely irreverent. And if somebody wants to make you do bullshit, well, then you're going to make it cost. All right. You can have me do this punch in thing, but you you accept the consequences of your own decisions. And what in that case, you kind of almost taught him how to be a better boss which is good followership by the way not many people talk about that in this space because you know followerships aren't leaders no but i think that's one of the major issues and that's why i said what i said a while back that like before you're allowed to start a, a an account in this space you have either have to do three years in corporate or three years in the military just to learn that how to follow and not be a douche because yeah. you can always tell like the accounts that they're made by someone who's never had a job. <laughs> that is true. Tell them no. Or, if you want to, by the way, yeah, for you guys at home, if you want to find the difference, say no to one of them. See how they react. That'll tell you everything you need to know. Or, you know, disagree with them. Personally, I treat disagreements very like I don't even engage now. I think you've tried to experiment with a bit of engagement on there, but like, yeah. I just stop engaging. I, I look at the account, and if they're less followers than me, I don't bother engaging. Yeah, I'm kind of leaning towards your side. I've been trying it, and it just doesn't it doesn't work as well as it should. Because like for me, it's like every time you have some dick trying to talk shit, it's always like this like 100 follower account that was made like in 2012 or some shit. So they've gotten like one follower a month for like 10 years. It's like even worse ratio than the dude who got an eight, le eight lace in 10 years of pickup. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you're probably not trying to grow your account that much, but like you could probably, like I'm pretty sure if I made a Twitter account now, I could get like a thousand followers in like three days I just from random so. tweets and shit. I should hope so. God knows if you're not that good at it at this point, right? So for me, that's just what it comes down to with the whole course thing. It's just figuring out what you're comfortable with doing. And if, if you're a good follower, you can always get stuff out of that. But at that point, you shouldn't try to be an entrepreneur. If you can't work with other people, you should probably try and do some solo shit and not screw. Because if you're not a good team player, you shouldn't be part of a team ever. Yeah. Because you ruin the other like five dudes who are trying to be a team. And not just that, it's so many things are scalable with teams that they aren't individually. If you, I don't think you could even do like build your own because no man's an island unless you just want to build log cabins in the woods and sell those off one, one man operation. You kind of have to rely on other people to some extent if you want to do anything past a certain level of success. So even if you don't want to work with others, just learning how to grin and bear it, I think is a strong skill to have. And it will be what separates Men from the boys, I guess. I don't know. What fancy twerds do you want to throw into that? 
I would just say, like, being able to put aside your own ego. Good way of putting it. I like that, actually. Because, like, well, it's it's something that's always going to come up. Like, let's say you meet a girl, and at some point, and you want to actually be serious, at some point, you're going to meet her fucking parents. Mm -hmm. You're going to meet her family. You're not going to like all of them. But because you actually want to be with this girl, you're kind of going to have to grin and bear it and work with it just because you don't want all of her friends and her family talking shit about you when you're not there. Not even that. It's just a sanity thing. If you're going to be spending every holiday from now until the end of time with these people, the last thing you want is like every time you get there, you realize it's going to be a three hour fight. It's like, that's just draining. Sometimes you just want to have, like I said, even, even Korea decided on an armistice. Just saying. <laughs> How about we stop oh, yeah. shooting you for a minute while I while I make some crops and build a Samsung phone? All right, fine. I won't shoot you. Well, you know, it's kind of because I come from a family with a lot of people who are very direct. Mm -hmm. And everyone is kind of loud. And everyone thinks they're the smartest person in the room. So our family dinners are kind of like we will debate each other hardcore. Right. Like the whole, a part of the reason why I know so much random shit is just on the basis that the, I found the only way to shut them the fuck up is to make <laughs> a point and then throw like three source references in there that they can't check at the dinner table without looking like idiots. <laughs> now, does it have to be real sources or you just throw some, anything at them as long as it makes look it up, even if you're wrong? Sometimes you make them up. It's, it's just, that's how, how it is. Like sometimes you make them up because they're not going to check them anyway. <laughs> it's kind of a douche move to do, but it's I say you're arguing with your being... family like you're arguing with a Redditor. <laughs> uh, no, my family is much worse than Reddit. Well, the only Ooh. difference between Reddit, a debate on Reddit and a debate with my family is that most of my family has actually gotten laid. Most Redditors haven't. <laughs> That one makes me laugh too more than it should. No, I swear to God, man. It's like the funniest thing I find with you know, like we doing a show about banging chicks uh, and being better on Twitch is like most of our audience are probably right now watching us on a second monitor while screaming at some dude over Xbox Live. Dude, that's awesome. More people should be doing that. I miss those days. I don't think those are there now. Like, I don't think you're allowed to drop F bombs on Xbox. No, I kind of miss that because, like, I think the gaming community in general has gotten off course. Because it used to be kind of like, we don't care, like, what color you are, who you uh, like to fuck, or what you identify as. No one cares. Yeah. What we care about is... Can you play? Why are why is your KD ratio so shit? <laughs> like, like, why are you dog shit at this game? Man? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Learn to play. That yeah. used to be like our thing. Like, if you're going to come here, everyone's welcome to come and play. And, you know, you'll give noobs a certain leeway. Just don't do insanely stupid shit. Exactly. And, and it's then like, whatever the soft spot is, that's what you go after. If it's a girl, well, here comes the rape jokes. If it's a guy, well, you're homosexual. But it was always clear. What's the thing that's most likely going to bother you? That's what you're going to get a ton of right now. And, you know, I kind of get where, like, and that's why I don't get the whole thing, like, girls aren't welcome in games, because, like, I've, yeah, you, you do see some shady shit when a girl joins a guild or something, because there's always going to be that one dude who wants to fuck her. Yeah. And he's going to kind of screw, or two dudes, worst case, you know, like, I, I was in a World of Warcraft guild back, like, in 2006, where, like, the the guild leader had his wife in the guild, Oh, and, and for like a couple of years there, one of the other like no, I think it was two or three other guildmates ended up fucking his wife, <laughs> and and this worked very well until we got to um, uh, pre nerf Muru in Sunwell Plateau in uh, the Burning Crusade, right. when the guild leader started yelling at two of the guys who had been fucking with his wife for screwing up the fight, and suddenly you hear over Ventrilo at that point, well, you know what? I fucked your wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, three other dudes were like, yeah, I fucked her too. <laughs> and at that point, that guild was just dead. Oh, yeah. Dude, I actually have a story like that one. Very awkward. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to say that, yeah. 
Yeah, I was also in a guild where a girl was sending nudes to the head of the loot council to get more gear. Fair enough. Was it? Were there at least nice nudes? No, that was the biggest problem. She wasn't even hot. Oh, I hate that stuff. But th that's how I actually practiced. My, used to practice my text game because I used to get all the girls I was playing uh, various online games with to send me nudes. <laughs> Look at you with your pro Jared movement. That's uh, the whole thing is just I miss the toxicity. Kind of forced you to be on your game, and you always knew. Like, do you always remember Call of Duty? I remember this Modern Warfare Two was always you'd be playing, and you know everybody's f bomb this and bitch that and blah blah blah. But there'd always be that one eight year old kid on there who one day was like a team player, and he's like, "Guys, I got your back, yo!" And then like the whole team kind of rallied around this like sweet innocent kid, and like you know what, we got him. And then they got his back and they carry it through. Those are the times I really enjoyed it. Yeah, but I actually liked a lot of that stuff. But it was like a mixture of team play and like locker room. Yeah. Although I don't think it works with girls. That's why no girls are in the locker room. It's not because guys don't want them there. It's just girls aren't hardwired for it. Like they take that reputation threat seriously as opposed to a guy where you're literally testing if you don't crumble like a bitch with any sort of like reputational attack well it's kind of like the best response that i've ever had uh on like someone calling me a faggot on call of duty mm -hmm. was just i told him yeah i fucked your dad and he liked it <laughs> i'm guessing he got off your back after that right probably even laughed <laughs> yeah like i never ever had had someone call me a faggot after that but it, it's kind of like girls aren't hardwired in a sense for that kind of level of trash talk no it's, because it's, I'm, it's, i, I kind of noticed that in like my one of my old guilds because we had quite a few girls in there and you kind of noticed that you got fewer and fewer girls as it was going on just because like you had like Let's say you had a 40 man raid team. Right. Th like 30 to 35 of them were men. And then you had five girls. And some girls are kind of wired that they're able to actually deal with the way men communicate when trying to be goal oriented. Right. And some girls can't handle it. Some girls can handle it. Like girls who work in finance, for instance, tend to be huge potty mouths. <laughs> I should hope so. Yeah, same with like a lot of girls that go into law, especially like corporate law. They're very masculine in their behavior. Corey, can you vouch for this? Hey, you can get him in here if you want to. I always love having Corey on. Yeah, I tell you what, I'll throw up a thing if he wants to come in. Uh, one sec, I got to find the damn link. There we go. Here, I'll send you a DM. You're, in, if you, you're more than welcome to come in if you want. I always got to find you on this stupid thing. Anyways, keep talking. Lawyer chicks. Yeah, well, well, I was just at like some, uh, it's like kind of like the, uh, you know, the U.S. Marines did this test for females in uh, frontline combat troops, right? Yeah. And well, they I, found I thought that, that was Israel. Or never mind. I know which one you're talking about, though. No, the U.S. Marines did it. And they kind of found that, okay, you know, like 98% of women can't handle it, but you have like 2% who can. So just have so the recommendation is just have stricter tests to make sure that only those two percent of women who can actually handle it, and they're usually like corn-fed fucking girls from like the Midwest have been hauling fucking cattle all their lives. Yeah, like you can let them be on the front line, but don't get like the vegan from California. Like don't let her be like in a Navy SEAL team. We just won't work like that. Yeah. And I think it just kind of works out like that. And even with gaming, you see that it's. Um, Girls and, well, men and women play different type of games. And the games men play, we tend to be kind of trash talky. It's like, it's like, we have like all kinds of races and religions in every guild I've been in. And like the only guy who actually got butthurt over like a race joke was like a Jew. <laughs> and I think the only reason he got butthurt was that the joke was about him being greedy. Oh, really? Of all the th oh, I guess yeah, fair enough. I guess that's the easy that's the easy one. <laughs> yeah, but the worst thing was he was greedy as fuck too, though. So it actually fit. <laughs> Dude, that's the thing. I could picture if I was part of like a a stereotyped minority group. Like there was this girl on ship. She was a steward, 
And she used to drink red wine with Coke because she hated the taste of wine, but she likes getting her drink on. And she used to get so messed up. She would like pass out and fall down the ladders. And I remember there was like another native guy that we worked with and he got so mad at her. He's like, you're setting us back like a hundred years, man. Stop being a stereotype. Get your shit together. <laughs> so no, I can I picture that being around like another Jewish guy and he's like really greedy and kind of scheming. And you're like, dude, come on. <laughs> Yeah, but it was like it was kind of like uh, back when I was uh, living in uh, the Netherlands. Yeah, I had a good friend who was Moroccan. Oh, and Moroccans have kind of a reputation for being kind of fighty, uh, beating people up in groups, you know, that type of shit. Oh, yeah, I know the one. Yeah. And we were on like the subway at one point and there was like a group of Moroccans like randomly harassing people trying to get into fights. And he got up and he walked over to them like, dudes, can you stop reinforcing all the stereotypes? I have to deal with this <laughs> shit when I go to work in the morning. <laughs> I know it's got to be a frustrating thing. But that's or who's it saying that I was just thinking, was it Ed Lattimore? I don't remember. Anyways, whatever. Back off that topic. At this point, we're gonna start dropping. Uh, we're gonna stop dropping slurs in here. <laughs> That's where this where this goes. Back to the topic, though. The course well, correction. The whole, point, the whole point of the course correction in this was like, you know, you're on the right track when people are actually starting to speak to you honestly, because that way, then you actually know that they care. Because I think we we've, we've gotten to a point in society where yeah. the only people who will legit give you a course correction are people who actually give a shit about you, because ninety percent of people won't care. Well, yeah. let's be honest, 99% of people won't care. The 1% of people who will actually tell you the truth honestly and reasonably directly are the people who actually care enough about you to actually risk your relationship. Yeah, which is and that is a sacrifice. As much as we say, it's like, oh, it's just being honest. Everybody should have the integrity for that. No, it's about sacrifice. Like, I like you enough that I'm willing to lose your friendship to tell you what you need to hear. And it's not a small thing to ask. But it's the same thing, like you said it earlier, like if your buddy starts dating a girl who's an absolute cunt, like most people aren't going to say anything. Most people's family aren't going to say anything if they hate the girl you're dating. Yep. Because they're like, okay, well, we don't want to get in a situation where it's like, okay, he'll choose her over us. Yeah, she'll bring it's it gonna... up as ammo against us. It just makes people feel uncomfortable. I don't like it. Let's just play nice. All kinds of justifications. Yeah, and, and like the people who actually are willing to tell you the truth are the people you actually need to keep around. Kind of like when you ask me, like, what the fuck is wrong with my diet? And I was like, well, <laughs> here's probably your problem. And you're like, yeah, I started weighing shit and you were right. Yep. <laughs> you just like any story that ends with you going, having somebody say you're right. Typical sphere account. Just say it, daddy. Yeah, you were yeah, right. Yeah. I will say, though, like, on a side note, like best thing I bought like recently mm -hmm. was a rice cooker. Really? You find that easier than like a microwave or stovetop method? It's a convenience thing. Hmm. Because you like, let's say I need a week's worth of rice. Because I like I eat rice with almost every meal just because I I don't deal well with anything other than like Rice, potatoes, and sourdough bread are basically like the only carbs I can process reasonably well. Yeah, that little bit of fermentation makes all the difference. So for me, like I, I eat rice with almost every hot meal is rice. So for me, it was I used to cook like my exact portion in a pot. But just being able to throw like, okay, I need six days worth of rice. You toss that in the rice cooker. Right. Then you can go and just get however much you just weigh out however much you need for the meal. It's just there and it's hot. And then towards the when it you get toward, towards the bottom, it starts to get kind of um, burnt a little bit. Right. You just take that and you make, fr make fried rice with it. So that's interesting. I don't mind. But for me, it's like a fairly easy thing. Just th two cups of rice, three cups of water, microwave for 10 minutes, let it fit, sit for 10 minutes. And I get perfect rice every time. Yeah, yeah, but the whole thing is, like, I get that perfect rice just sitting on my counter. Mm -hmm. So, and if you're doing, like, a stir-fry, it's going to take you, like, five minutes to do a stir-fry. Right. And it's going to take you fucking 20 minutes to cook rice. No, fair enough. So it's just literally, like, always there. 
Yeah, so for me, it was just like getting to be annoying that, okay, you know, my stir fry is done, but I still have to set my, let my fucking jasmine sit there for like seven minutes because it's like high maintenance rice. <laughs> Dude, I'm hooked on the basmati now. I can't believe I left that for the longest time. If you guys don't have it, basmati, it's just got the best mouthfeel ever. I, I, it, really? You, you, you think so? I think so. Yeah, it's got the longer, the thinner grains. They're more fibrous. I just like it way more than your typical long grain and basmati. Jasmine, eh. I like. I won't complain with Jasmine, but if I had a choice, I'll go with Basmati now. I don't know. For me, it's more like it depends on what you're having with it. Like if you're having Indian food, you obviously want Basmati, right? If you're having like anything you eat with chopsticks, you want Jasmine. I guess I'll have to experiment. I haven't made like a fried rice with uh, Basmati yet. So I'll have to try that out and see what happens. Well, to be honest, like fried rice work, works with any rice, but it's just like my general observation is jasmine is a bit stickier. Yeah. So it's easier to eat with chopsticks versus basmati. That's more like it doesn't stick as much and has a different mouthfeel, but it's very good. Like if you're having an Indian food to kind of mix into the sauce. Yeah, you got a point there. I'll have to run some experiments and try. I'll let you know, but right now I'm stuck with it. Whatever. Oh, I guess we were arguing about what type of rice do you like better. I mean, I could work with whatever. Okay, why the fuck would you cook jasmine rice with vanilla extract and a teaspoon of sugar? I mean, it's not like oh. a dessert or some shit. No, well, that's kind of the same texture, like the same taste as horchata. In fact, he's pretty much describing making horchata, but instead of what you're supposed to do is blend it with water to the point where you could like extract all the starches from the, the rice to get it. But yeah, that's a common thing. A lot of Mexicans like love that as a dish. Ah, fair enough. Like it's, I've never had it, but it just seemed strange because, like, I had a, have a strange time with the rice as a dessert. Yeah, really? rice pudding is the exception. Rice pudding is the exception. Yeah, it's. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just one of those things. I think it's if you had it when you're young, you'll like it. Cause my girl likes it. I'm the same way. I don't like that. I don't like tapioca. Um, Mexican candy, I can't stand either, but that's only because Mexican candy is like, hey, you know what we should do with this candy? We should make it spicy and not sweet. And I'm like, why? But yeah, I don't know. that's a thing, though. Like, it's one of the weirder things you start noticing with like people from, let's say, heavy chili countries. Mm -hmm. Like, if I like, I'll occasionally snack on like cucumber or paprika, you know, that type of thing. Right. Like, just cut off a bell pepper or something. Like, I've seen people like legit snacking on like habaneros. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Or like, um, like I can handle my spices reasonably well. Like I, I eat a lot of jalapenos. I eat a lot of you know red chilies, that type of thing. Yeah. But when I see someone like snacking on a fucking habanero pepper, it's just a sign that what the fuck is wrong with that person? They just had way too much chili early in their life. One of those guys that just are immune to capsicum or some crap like that. I agree. Well, like when you're when you're sitting there and you're eating a fucking habanero like a goddamn apple, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, what are you going to? Oh, I'm going to have a have a plum because I have a bit of a sweet thing. What are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to just eat this fucking habanero pepper. And it's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Get out of my house, you psycho! <laughs> yeah, I bet you it's one of those people that just aren't affected by it or their pain tolerance is super high. But when whatever, whatever well, they seem to like. To bring like a wrestling reference in this, you know, you have this uh, show called Hot Ones. Have you seen yeah. it? I know the one. Yeah, and they had, uh, I think they had Daniel Bryan on there at one point. He's a, he's one of the best wrestlers ever. Okay. And at, they're sitting there eating these super hot wings, and the guy who hosts the show, he's sitting there sweating, he's obviously in pain, and you're not, like, seeing any reaction from Daniel Bryan. And the guy's like, dude, isn't this spicy, dude? And he's like, yeah, but I'm, I'm a wrestler, and sometimes you have to fake that you're injured when you're not and sometimes you have to fake that you're fine when you're absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> and i think that's one of the funnier things like and i think that's where it comes from when they say that someone's uh, like he's tough but he's not wrestling tough <laughs> you got to be tough enough to look like you're not even hurt yeah like like uh i my favorite example of that Nick is Foley? uh uh, fully no a actually triple h really yeah Why because he had that uh, he had a fight with chris jericho uh-huh 
where I think he, the fight went for 15 minutes, and I think he tore his quad like five minutes in. Ugh. And he went for another 10 fucking minutes and even took like the walls of Jericho, which is like a in like a high angle Boston crab. Yeah. With his um quad torn. And you couldn't even tell that he was injured. Okay, that's impressive. I'll give you that. I don't know if it's like I have a tooth coming in through my nose, like smiling impressive, but as impressive. Yeah, but Mick Foley too is like the, the pain tolerance is just insane. And to be honest, if you have that pain tolerance, that's a sign that you just chose the wrong course for your life, man. <laughs> Fair enough. And Andre the Actually, Giant, he was another big one on that too. Like, how many wasn't that match after Hulk Hogan and WrestleMania three? Didn't he like back surgery after that? Yeah, something like that. For me, that's just one of those. I've actually had to try and get better with some things like that because I'm I'm the kind of guy like if if ibuprofen and alcohol can handle it, I'm not yeah. sick enough to go to a doctor. Yeah. And I've actually had to actually get better with that because like I went to a, my doctor, well, to a doctor for the first time in like 12 years. And he's like, okay, well, you know, here you actually broke your nose. You broke your ankle at this point. You've obviously had like three broken fingers. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> That's cool. Well, that's the thing, though. Getting older, you get better at you kind of you kind of know what's wrong with you. So when you walk in, you kind of know what you're expecting. I think that's like a big benefit with getting older for me. When I walk in, I already kind of know what I want the outcome to be. Yeah, this is the problem with this. It's most likely something like this. Maybe he'll teach me something I don't know. But at least then I walk out of there with like a medication or a certain like something to fix it. If they ever offer me any coping stuff, do you just want some painkillers? I'm like, no, that just makes me hurt less, but it doesn't fix anything. So why waste the time and risk the Percocet addiction? Yeah, but you're you grew up on a ranch, right? So you're kind of familiar with the whole thing. Like, okay, you can walk that shit off. Yeah. <laughs> well, not that I can. Is that I will? <laughs> I I am told to, or I'm basically gonna get a rock upside the head. <laughs> yeah, it's like I took off two fingers with a hatchet. Well, you know. Here's some duct tape and super glue. Deal with it. Yeah. And a lot of the times you'll have something like utter bomb lying around. So you got your old little voodoo stuff anyway, that kind of treats things. There is a yeah. veterinarian there too. And it's like human. What's a human? Just another primate. How would you treat a monkey with this thing? Well, can I have that? Yeah. Okay. Fear. Thanks. Thanks doc. Yeah. Like I remember my old, like I dealt, like I had a neighbor who was an old country doctor at one point and he used mm -hmm. to carry one of those doctor bags. Oh, cool. And you just like, like and I, he was one of my drinking buddies and he would have that doctor bag with him when he was out drinking. <laughs> and, you know, at one point, like one of the guys in the band wasn't doing too well. And this guy was really into music. So he walks up to the stage. He's like, hey, dude, what the fuck's wrong with your guitarists? And the guitarist like, well, you know, I have a cold. I'm not feeling well. And he just opened his bag. He's like, take two of these. And start playing properly. And it just went back to the table and started drinking again. <laughs> <laughs> I miss those. Little, that's the one thing I miss about guy doctors. Like I got a girl doctor now and they're always like, they're afraid to be honest with you. I almost, you know what I mean? Where he's like, yeah, dude, you're do you're acting like crap right now. Like giving you a little harsh thing. Like maybe you're whining a little too much. Like, dude, walk it off. You're fine. You don't need Percocet. I don't think a lot of doctors do that now. If physician rehab is in the chat. You let me know there, scurvy. But and I'm wondering if that's kind of feeding into this little hypochondria epidemic where everybody's on SSRIs or uh, antipsychotics, I think is the newest SSRI because, you know, why do I need inhibitors when I can have, I don't even know what the other ones are. I guess Ambien's the only one I can think of. Ambien and Xanax. Well, Ambien are sleeping meds, right? Xanax is more like anti-anxiety. Oh, fair enough. But yeah, some of the harder corns, like whatever, Zopaclone is pretty tame. It's got a really crappy taste to it. But then there's some of that hardcore stuff. I tried it once where they had it. I can't remember if it was after a surgery or something, maybe anxiety. I don't remember. And I had one and then I slept for eight hours or nine hours. And then I woke up feeling like I just got out of surgery. And I'm like, yeah, I'm done with that. <laughs> that's the worst feeling on earth. How could anybody want this? No, but it's kind of like, I think that's one of the things like it's a young man thing. And I'm kind of getting used to the fact that I'm like, I'm, I'm not old. Like I'm younger than you, but I'm I'm not a young man anymore. And once you like when you're like under thirty, mm -hmm. your body kind of fixes itself. Yeah. 
when once you get over like 35 and especially from what i hear once you get over like 40 you start to actually suffer consequences from shit well i think you get the consequences of the stuff you had because like my back pain started when i was 24 maybe 25 and you're right i bounced like i remember being on 2,500 milligrams of ibuprofen a day to, to basically function on it. Otherwise, it was just too much pain to handle. Obviously not healthy. But then getting into your 30s and later, it's just you can have X amount of injuries. And eventually, it starts to catch up with you. It's not even that your body's getting older. It's the same as a car. If you keep denting the hood enough, eventually, you're going to have a dented up hood. It doesn't matter how old the car is. I'm assuming if I was the guy who started getting back problems at 13, I'd be feeling it at 25. It's just a well, time for me, it's more like, like one of the major things, like I used to go in to the, like back when I had my own home gym. Yeah. I used to like get up from my desk when I was working and just go into my home gym and do like a set of like three times three, like four or 500 pound deadlifts. Oh, without even warming up. Like, you know, the picture I sent you like a while back yeah, when yeah. I was like at the end of the cut. I was still deadlifting about, uh, let's see, kilo wise. I was lifting about I can translate. It's fine. 70, 170, 180 kilos. Okay. For deadlifts. No warm up. I just walk in, do the lifts, and walk back out. <laughs> like now, I actually have to stretch and warm up. That's true. Like yeah, I, that first set with the bar, that is, that is the one thing I will admit. It kind of took some getting used to. Yeah, like, like I start, like, and you do, like, if, let's say you're doing strong lifts five by five, like, you do, like, one warm up set on top of that with, like, really light weight just to get everything working. It's also why I don't work out in the morning anymore. Too hard to get into it. Yeah, I've noticed that. It, it's always been like a morning thing for me. It's kind of, you need no, some, me, you need to loop things up first. Yeah, like, I, I need to actually have my body working for a while. Like, it's not like I, I used to be able to just take my coffee in like a travel mug and go work out. <laughs> All these guys with protein shakes, you're walking in with like one of them coffee thermos. <laughs> like that's Pump not out happening a couple anymore. Plates. <laughs> like I, I, yeah, I actually legit need like getting started in the morning. Like I, I legit need like 45 minutes now of just sitting there with like a huge glass of water and like three coffees. Oh, dude, it's like a ritual for me now. I love it. I don't even know if I need to have it. I just enjoy it so much. I never want to give it up. But do you have like water with your coffee or do you just have coffee? I'll have like I start with just the coffee and then I have oh, I'll have a glass of water with me. And then once I'm done the coffee, I'll chug that down depending on how I feel. But I usually do need some water afterwards. If that morning pee comes out yellow, then I usually start with the water. But it all depends how much I drink the night before. Yeah, I don't know. No, is that that's never a an question. Old person like thing, every night, I'm being unaware weight. of your health thing, where you actually start noticing if you're dehydrated or not. Well, you know, like I, I never paid attention to it, but I do have a couple of friends who like been. They're like they almost have poo journals. Like, okay, my poop this day was like deep brown and it was solid, or like I had diarrhea this day. And I'm like, I'm never going to get to that point. Like, if my doctor asked me how how was your poop, and I'm like, oh well gone like once a day what else like i don't pay attention to it like i noticed like the dehydration thing i do notice but that's only because i'm like aware of it yeah but actually it might have been the military because they were always big on that taking adequate drink drink breaks and that might have been just a I, do think, thing. I do think that's a course thing that you have to deal with once you get above a certain age because you can absolutely fucking destroy yourself when you're 20. yeah like, you can spend, like, a week partying, do, like, a six-hour hangover, and then you're good. Once you're over 30, if you spend a week partying, you're going to be hungover for a fucking week. <laughs> like, it used to be, like, okay, you, your hangover is one day. Now it's, like, I don't get hangovers, so I'm kind of special there. I just never get, like, a proper hangover. Right. But I can kind of tell with like people I know who are getting older that their hangovers keep getting worse and they're having to do like before they go to bed, they're having to chug like a Gatorade. They have to get some food in them before they go to bed. 
And these are guys who used to be like, okay, you know what? They wake up in the morning, they do a line of Coke, do a shot of whiskey, and they're good to go for the day. Hair of the dog. Like, okay. <laughs> and now they're like, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll do that line, but can we wait until lunch? Because I'm really, really looking for my an acid to kick in. You know what was for me, though? It was like adrenaline. Like, I would wake up the next morning, and I'm like, wow, I've only slept three hours, and I've been out drinking all night. I feel great. And I'd walk into work, and people are like, dude, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I feel great. I go look in the mirror. It looks like I got hit in the face with a shovel, but I felt fine. And then, like, one o'clock in the afternoon hits in, and the adrenaline kicks off, and then I just, like, I need to rest now. Like, universal soldier or some shit. I'm wondering if it's almost that I just don't get that adrenaline rush in the mornings anymore. Well, what you do then, well, in that specific scenario, I can give you a chip. Just <laughs> chug a fucking Red Bull, man. Yeah. Oh, dude. I, I was even doing that then. It has like, I, I didn't even get Red Bull. Liquid caffeine, or if you ever never had it, awesome stuff. Get some. A cap full of it basically turns every drink into a Red Bull. No, what I used to do is, like, uh, my, even my coworkers started bringing me this when they could tell I was a bit under the weather. Yeah. It's a glass of Red Bull like a pint of Red Bull and they drop two no dose tablets in it. Like the, uh, the things that dissolve. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so that's like, you know, yeah, I, I used to just chug one of those when it hit that lunchtime kind of crunch and your entire body is like, okay, we have sugar, we have caffeine. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and then the rest was just sucking it up, realizing you hurt and that's okay. And I think that's kind of the main thing, though, with your course and like the journey you're going to go through life. I think it's the main thing is just building a tolerance to ship. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to have to build a tolerance to people disagreeing with you. Like the whole, like I used to be like a really compliant, nice worker. Like right now, I'm fucking hard to work with because if I don't like what's going on, I'll just fuck off. Yeah. And it's, it's a mixture of abundance mindset, and it's also a recognition that, like, you know that old man honesty? Like, the dude, like, the old, like, the 80-year-old dude who'll sit there and, he, you know, he'll fart at the dinner table. He he just doesn't give a shit anymore because he's old. Yeah, he's earned he's earned it because he's, yeah, I, I'm not going to live long enough to care. So I think that's kind of what you develop, and you develop that tolerance towards all the things life throws at you. And the important thing there is just not building that tolerance to a level where you're it's hurting your self-awareness. Oh yeah, this I love this one. Two percent legit injury, ninety-eight percent don't be a bitch. That's a favorite <laughs> chat today. <laughs> that's that's like my favorite chat message today, I think. Yeah, you win the internet for today. It was good because that guy kept sending dick pics there. He was winning it for a while. <laughs> I guess that's a Twitch thing. I feel bad for banning him now because that's just going to be the way it's going to be. I'm going to feel kind of bad about it. Yeah, plus, like, how are you going to get a good Bitcoin course when you ban the one Bitcoin guy from your chat on Twitch? Oh, dude. Yeah, I know. That's... Bitcoin is like Star Wars for me. Like, I really like the, the series, but I hate the fans. Does that make sense yeah. to you? Yeah, I completely agree with you. Like, I like Bitcoin, but I just hate people who are into Bitcoin. Yeah, and it really Same annoys thing me. Same thing. Like, I love true crime, but I hate people who are into true crime. Yeah. What are the other? What are the other ones? There's Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty fans are the worst. Redditors. CrossFit. Love Reddit. Hate Redditors. CrossFit. Uh, vegans for sure. Yeah. Well, except for I don't like veganism. <laughs> Not me neither, but it's like I hate vegans just in general. Yeah, but I'm thinking things like what would be otherwise an awesome system that is ruined by the people who enjoy the system. I also like like the Gandhi quote. I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Yeah, that's a good one. Christianity. Here's another one. Uh, I'm saying starting to argue like second gen Islam as well. Like not the guys in the Middle East. Those guys, I talk to a lot of them and they're pretty switched on. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've had a bunch of, like, uh, anti-Islam stuff lately on Twitter. No. Like my latest one, this guy kept going off when I was talking about, like, uh, doing it in the pooper. Just kind of like a dominance thing. I don't really care, but I'm like, oh, whatever. People are mad. Let's roll and let's lean into it. And then he's talking about how horrible and dirty it is, but he's talking about it like somebody who's never had anal sex before. So finally, I'm like, you know what? Screw it. Let's do a poll. Let's leave it to the gods. And I'm like, what do you find more disgusting? Doing it in the pooper or doing your cousin? <laughs> <laughs> and the third option being, I'm a cousin. Let me see. Not going to lie. Like, 
anal sex one is less disgusting, but it didn't win by a lot. So there's apparently a lot of guys out there who really want to sleep with their first cousins. Kind of screwed, yeah. kind of screwed with my head. Well, the thing is, I'm like, I kind of get like the whole dominance aspect of um, of um, anal sex. Yeah, I'm just not a huge fan. Same, same as me. I don't. I, I get it. I just, it's not for me. If I had it, I wouldn't cry. But that was the thing, though. Like, if you had to pick between your cousin and the pooper, like, is that even an issue? For, it well, is, to be is fair, a, though, like, like I got a I hot know cousin. Quite, well, like, I, I have quite a few like Muslim girls in my like social circle, and yep. quite a few of them do it in the pooper to save their virginity for marriage. Same as yeah. Catholic. Oh, that's the thing. I remember Catholics in the '80s remind me of Islamic girls in the 2020s or 2010s, hundred percent. And I just laugh at that, or like Sikh girls in the '90s. Like I guarantee you, a lot of these Muslim girls probably have like white boyfriends that they hide from their families until they reach the epiphany phase, and then they settle down with like a a good Islam boy. They have all these like, anything but traditions. That way, they can still keep the their virginity. But I mean, to me, like if I had to rate like sex, it would be like oral, vaginal, anal hand jobs. From best to worst? Best to worst, yeah. Actually, that's a pretty good... Yeah, I'd say so. I'd put handies above above oral, or above anal, though. I just find them more fun. Like, there's more of a visual show in front of you. Yeah, that's a fair point. But, like, <laughs> it's just, like... I just don't... I Like, I kind of get why guys are into it. Because it's like that it's forbidden, it's kind of dirty thing. Yeah. But at the same time, though, it's like... Eh. <sighs> I think Rule Zero Dad kind of puts it. <laughs> oh, yeah. This yeah. is why you buy a rice prep. cooker. <laughs> yeah, too much prep time for a new. Yeah, exactly. It's like you have to do too much work to actually make it happen. So I think he has a good point on that. It's like with anything else, you can kind of do that in the throes of passion with anal. If you oh, yeah, want it no to be recent. Anal. No, like if you want it to be reasonably clean, the girl has to like prep in beforehand. You have to have the fucking lube ready. And like I have a chest full of sex toys. So I'm all of, I, I know what prep is like, but at the same time, though, it's like you can grab most of those and it's kind of fun in the moment. It's, I don't know. It's just never been my thing. I know like Donovan, I know, is, is a huge fan. Oh, I'm sure he is. Oh, I love it. Okay. We have a new winner in chat. <laughs> All right, guys. Apparently, we got a contest going on. Who's got the best take on on the tweet <laughs> or best take on Twitch? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm actually going to steal that and tweet and tweet that one. Ah, oh, son of a! I kind of feel sick. He was going to start a new brand. We're getting everybody on the brand right now. Get on Xanax, mix it with booze, quote some inspirational stuff that's hiding a glaring insecurity. You too can have a hundred thousand followers on Twitter and talk about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually going to try and do something. Let's see. Currently, but you see what I mean, though, about Twitch. It's kind of got. It's a little more raw than YouTube. Like everybody's a little more comfortable being uh, a little less filtered. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of becoming fond of it. I refer to it as the radio. Like YouTube is like TV, and this is like the radio. Well, the thing is, like I kind of understood that Twitch was like a good medium when you actually saw like salad bakers do like a speed run of Nax and the raid leader was just like dropping end bombs nonstop and he wasn't getting banned. <laughs> oh, that's impressive. Never dropped an end bomb myself. I got to admit out of all the profanity I've ever thrown out on anything online, the hard oh, R, even the soft R never been a thing. I call my dog. I drop it on my dogs every now and again. Like the one that's in the, like the seal gray color. I'll drop an end bomb on him, but always in the privacy of my own home and, <laughs> only because yeah, he looks like, at me like I don't care. <laughs> yeah, like I'll drop them, but only when like I find that like my cursing gets worse depending on what I'm doing. Like if I'm gaming, it's like peak bad. <laughs> it's because you're in hyper competitive mode. But like if I'm working, like I'll drop the occasional swear word, but I've kind of trained myself over the years to eliminate a lot of swearing while I'm in a corporate environment. It's probably smart. Like occasionally one slips out, but it, it doesn't happen. It's just kind of training. So I think that's kind of what you'd learn as you go along too. It's 
what Tech. to do in what environment and you kind of develop your own kind of mask for that environment. Yeah. So on that note, I guess we'll end it on there. Learn not to swear at work so you can swear on the Xbox. Don't use the hard R and if you if you can help it. Uh, thanks guys for tuning in. Like I said, it's I'll have this up. So Twitch has a 24 hour thing where they get it for one day. So tomorrow, if you guys want to catch us out on YouTube while you're doing a workout, if you missed the beginning, it'll be there. We'll probably pull some clips. I'll throw that on the second channel. Digital Ryan, if you haven't seen it. Carl's always got Gendernomics 1 and 2. He's had a great audio book from some Dutch feller. And uh, I guess half an hour, my channel on YouTube, Rule Zero. What was our topic? The myth of the strong independent whammon. Have we? Oh, look at you dick riding off of those tweets. <laughs> I may actually drop in on that one. Ooh, that'll be fun. Yeah, that's good. So right now, Rich can't make it. So it's me, Rolo, and John. And with the four of us, okay. I kind of want to keep it more intimate. So we won't do like the giant six-person panel this time. But you're hosting, right? So are we on Twitch or YouTube? No, no, YouTube. Dude, I'm not going to... Like, Rolo, here, come on to Twitch. Just, yeah, yeah we'll lose them. <laughs> like having Rolo on Twitch is kind of like having Metallic on Napster. It just doesn't work, man. Yeah, I'm tempted to one of these days. Like, people want to get him to do like a Warhammer 20,000 thing. Well, that, that's the thing I think is the funniest thing about Rolo is like, I actually like seeing the personality of all the guys we're actually doing this with because everyone has some, like Rich has this cars, which is kind of his nerdy hobby, but like John yeah. is playing Dark Souls, I think. Yep. Uh, Rolo is really into um, Warhammer and you're really into Mega Man from what I can gather in old like <laughs> NES games. Stuff, yeah. Yeah, like, I would like love to Sims get back into stuff. that. That's why I like Factorio. I love the toys, the things you can just putter around with. But that's actually an interesting topic we should do at some point. Like, because men play SimCity, and girls play The Sims. <laughs> actually, that is pretty... That's actually really accurate. I like that as a title, too. That would, be a great, that. that would be a great topic for our show next week, man. Dude, I like that. I'm leaving you a DM with uh, the Chesty channel just because of it. What is it? Sims versus Sim City. Plus, it'll get that gamer crowd. Sim City's relevant, totally. All right. Anyways, yeah. guys, we gotta go. I gotta grab breakfast. Uh, I'll see you in half an hour, Carl. We may or may not see you in half an hour. I'll check you guys later.